Okay, so today we're doing another Q&A episode here, which is audio only. That means that this will run kind of like a podcast. So unglue your eyes from the screen and go build something while you listen to this. Today's topics are going to be backstrip woods, head plate thickness, and we're also talking about butt joints for the neck joint. This question comes from the members forum. It comes from Andrew. Andrew, by the way, attended one of my eight-day workshops last year in March, and Andrew is working on another build, it seems. Andrew writes, the build is going well. I've bent up the other side this weekend, and I have a few questions. I'm using Indian rosewood for the back and was wondering, can I use the same material for the reinforcing back strip that goes on the inside of the back? And he also writes that, yes, the grain will be running 90 degrees to the back, which is good. Um, He has a second question here, but first let me tackle this first question about the backstrip. So the backstrip is essentially just a thin graft that stitches up the seam between the two plates of the back. And really you can use pretty much any wood with little consequence to things like the tone. Although at least in theory there should be some consequence to using unusually dense woods. That's why most guitars you see will be using some sort of cross grain soft wood, usually cross grain Sitka spruce, just because of availability, but cedar is used often for the backstrip. Whatever the maker is using for the braces, they'll likely use for the backstrip as well. But honestly, if extra rosewood is what you have, it's really not a big deal to just go ahead and use that for the backstrip, especially when you're just getting started out. If you really wanted to geek out on the absolute minutia of lightweight construction on the plates, then yeah, I would seek out some cross grain spruce or cedar, but we're talking about a pretty trivial difference here. So I really wouldn't worry about it much. The back strip is after all on the back plate where these sort of uh, concerns of super lightweight construction are important, but less important than say if it were on the soundboard where I would really be concerned about it. But in your question there, you did hit on a good point, which is keeping that grain 90 degrees to the prevailing grain of the back. Um, That cross grain pattern there allows the back strip to act sort of like a stitch, stitching up that seam. You can also think of it as acting like the alternating plies in plywood. So the only way you can really get the back strip wrong is to have the grain running lengthwise, then the backstrip really isn't doing anything. And then Andrew has a second question here. His second question is, on your scarf joint, you go a half inch on the head thickness, and then it looks like an eighth of an inch head plate. I've seen it done another way, which is five eighths of an inch head thickness with just a thin veneer on the head plate. I prefer your method as I think running the eighth of an inch material over the scarf joint makes the whole assembly stronger. Is that why you do that or is it just decorative? So I prefer the thicker head plate over the veneer for two reasons. And the first reason you nailed it, it's, it is somewhat structural to place thicker head plate. Yes, about an eighth of an inch thick. That's how thick my head plates are. That does shore up that scarf joint a little bit. You may also notice that some people simply have the scarf joint in a different location, but that actually comes with its own problems that I'm not going to get into here, just so I can keep to the question here. Um, So yes, the first reason is to shore, shore up that joint, like I said. The second reason is to create more of a positive backstop for the nut slot. So the nut slot, as you know, is basically formed by the height of the fretboard at the top of the neck and the height of the headstock, or I mean head plate, and the space between those two points is the nut slot on an acoustic guitar. It's a little different on an electric, of course, as they don't have head plates. With the thicker head plate, you end up with a nut slot that more so envelops the nut on all sides. Whereas with the hyper thin veneer head plate, you basically have the nut making contact with the neck at the bottom of the slot and the end grain of the fretboard. But on the back edge of the nut, it's not making solid contact with anything. And so the nut in that case is more of a separate piece to the instrument than it is when it's actually burrowed into it like it is when you have that eighth of an inch thick head plate. 
One more thing I want to say about the structural aspect of it is just that if you do that scarf joint correctly, honestly, it's structural enough, especially if you're not building, you know, hard gigging guitars, which as an independent craftsman, you shouldn't be building those types of guitars anyway. Those are, those needs are more than adequately met by factory instruments. But I mean, it does make me feel a little bit better to know and should make anyone feel better to, to know that that joint is reinforced by the head plate. And by the way, if you really wanted to uh, reinforce it even further, adding a back plate to the headstock, which people do more for aesthetic reasons, will also reinforce that joint on the other side. Generally, uh, when people do back, back plates, they're a little thinner, so it won't reinforce it as much as that thick head plate, but you know, it's another thing that just makes you feel really good about um, the strength of that joint. Back plates are fairly tricky to execute though, so if you're thinking about doing a back plate, I would do it for the primary reason, which is just the aesthetics of it. It really looks sharp. I wouldn't do it for the structural reason that I just mentioned. Um, that's more like just a extra incidental, you know, good thing that you get out of it. And honestly, I might be attributing more structural integrity to the back plate than it really deserves. And this question comes from Andrea. Hey Eric, I love your videos. What kind of a joint would you recommend I use for attaching the guitar to the body? And he or she, I'm sorry, Andrea, I don't, I'm not sure if that's a male or female name. Um, I, th I think it's a female name. So I'm gonna call you she. In a separate question, she asked me specifically about using a butt joint and so first I'm going to answer whether or not you can use a butt joint for the neck joint. So the butt joint, for those who don't know, is really the simplest of joints. It is really just the absence of a joint. It's the back of the heel butting up right against the uh, neck joint area of the upper bout of the guitar. So there's no mortise and tenon, there's no dovetail, nothing like that. You just have two flat surfaces meeting together. And then, of course, the fretboard tongue is also an, an attachment point that goes out over the top. The advantage of this joint is obvious. It's just an easier to execute joint. So it's much, much more likely that you're going to execute it well. And it's, there's not going to be gaps that are visible or anything like that. I've never used this joint on a guitar myself and will never use this joint on a guitar. And I'll, in a moment, get, get to why. But I first want to say that I have heard of some other people using a butt joint for a guitar, so it's not completely unheard of, especially with ukulele makers. I've heard of a lot of ukulele makers, especially hobbyist ones, using a butt joint just for its simplicity. And the ukulele is a much simpler instrument with less tension and stress being put on the instrument on a constant basis so that it can handle a simpler joint. And I've heard of some guitar makers using this joint as well but uh, it's always been for the ease of it and not for any other structural or functional advantage. The downside of using this joint, and it's a pretty major downside if you think about it, is that this joint is basically permanent. Even if you could eventually work your way under the joint with hot spatulas and remove that joint, you would do so much damage to the guitar in the process that you would probably ruin it. And here's the thing. After 20 to 40 years, let's say, every guitar needs a neck reset. That constant tension that is being applied to that instrument over time forces the relationship of the neck to the body into a position where the action of the guitar is greatly affected and the only way to fix it is to perform a neck reset, which means taking apart that joint. So the joint that I do recommend for most people is the Balton Mortise and Tenon joint because that is the most easily removable joint. There's no glue in that actual joint of the neck, although there is glue under the fretboard tongue, but it's far easier to, uh, especially if a trained luthier or guitar tech is working on your instrument, it's much easier to remove the glue from under the fretboard and very cleanly reset that neck if it's a bolt-on mortise and tenon than it is if it's any other type of joint where it has glue 
in the actual neck pocket. So even the dovetail neck is, yes, it's still removable to do a neck reset, but it's very hard to perform neck resets on dovetail necks. Not that you can't do it, but again, you really just need um, someone who really knows what they're doing to do that well without severely damaging the instrument in the process. Another reason in your case to avoid a dovetail neck joint is because obviously if you're asking about a butt joint, you're looking for simplicity and ease of execution. And dovetail necks are simply difficult to execute. It's much easier for a beginner to dive into the mortise and tenon neck, although that is more difficult than the butt joint. I think it's just a better option long term. So in conclusion here, the only reason that I would think that you should do a butt joint is if you're kind of accepting that this first guitar is just something to learn and experiment with and maybe that step of performing the neck joint is really holding you back, as it does for a lot of people, it's a difficult step, then yeah, you can sort of skip that step by doing a butt joint. But that instrument will no longer be able to um, survive in the long term or is less likely to survive in the long term when it comes time for that neck reset. So it's just something to think about if you really value that instrument as a keepsake or if you just want to sort of get through it as a way to learn and then later on you develop the skills to do a mortise and tenon or a dovetail or a more appropriate and less permanent joint. Okay, so that's it for now. Um, keep those questions coming. Uh, I love you guys, and I will see you guys in the next Q&A episode. Bye for now. If you learned something here, please give this video a like and subscribe so you can be notified when I release a new DIY guitar making video every Friday. And if you want to really learn more, take one of my structured online courses at ericschaferguitars.com or register for a hands-on guitar building workshop here with me in Burnville, Pennsylvania.